Testing in production sounds like a cop-out, but it's not. For some things, it's the only way to test. So what is the role of testing in production? What sorts of tests make sense and how should we fit them into our broader test strategy? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Thanks to our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis, and Transfic. They're all helping us to develop our channel, so please do support them by checking out their links in the description below in turn. My book, Modern Software Engineering, explores the ideas that I think are foundational for doing a good job in software development. Today's episode touches on two of these ideas, working experimentally and the importance of feedback. If you'd like to learn more about these ideas and how they fit together with a bunch of others to increase your chances of success, whatever the nature of your software, then check out the book. There's a link in the description below. When teams that practice continuous delivery talk about testing in production, they aren't being irresponsible and suggesting that we throw untested code out, assuming that our users will scream if it's bad, while crossing our fingers that it won't fail too badly. There's a switch that I've seen happen in many teams that adopt continuous delivery, where they become kind of obsessed with the quality of the systems that they're producing. So the last thing on their minds when they're talking about testing in production is cutting corners on quality, quite the reverse in fact. What this means is that in the context of continuous delivery, testing in production always means in addition to all the other testing, not instead of it. I am sure that there are some teams that do try to cut corners on testing by crossing their fingers and avoiding black cats or whatever. But I put these teams into the same category as teams that don't use version control. They've got a poor idea of what it takes to do a good job and or are working on software that no one, including them, cares much about. So let's focus on testing in production for teams that do know what they're doing and do care about their software. For them, testing in production is part of a bigger test strategy. The approach that I promote has testing built in, ingrained into the process of developing software. So these teams will have a deployment pipeline of some form, giving them fast, clear feedback on their changes. First, from the perspective of their technical correctness, which we can evaluate using continuous integration in the commit stage. And then, in terms of the releasability of the change, which we can evaluate in the acceptance cycle. At the conclusion of a transit of our deployment pipeline, our code is releasable without any more work. So the pipeline is definitive for release. So if the pipeline passes, our change is ready for release. But we aren't quite done yet. When I teach people about continuous delivery, as part of my description, I often say that the definition of done in continuous delivery is working software delivering value to users. This is one of the reasons that the DevOps idea of you build it, you run it is important. We don't really know that our software is working or if it's doing the right things until it's really in use and really being useful. So we need to find ways to close that vital feedback loop. That's, that's what I mean by testing in production. We're likely to trip over some differences in terminology here. Some of what I am about to describe will sound a lot like monitoring or observability to people, which is fair. My view of testing in production includes monitoring and observability. But thinking in terms of these things being tests, even better, being experiments, adds some extra value, I believe. We can imagine monitoring CPU usage or disk space, but this data is utterly useless if no one's paying any attention to it or understands what it really means. The next step then is that we can think of someone keeping an eye on these things, someone who can react when the measurements get outside of a sensible range. Now we've established a feedback loop, but we're relying on the observer's implicit understanding of what sensible range means. This also relies on the diligence of the per person doing the monitoring. What happens if the numbers go outside the range at 3am? Will our observer still see it and respond in time? 
Next step is that we can imagine adding some kind of an alert perhaps. If the CPU usage goes beyond 90% for more than two seconds, send an alert. And we could, if we wanted to, make wake somebody up based on the alert. By now, I'd say this is a test. Not really just monitoring anymore. This test asserts that the CPU usage remains below 90%. Treating this as a test from the outset forces us to think about what counts as a pass and what as a failure. It's a step beyond merely collecting data. If you want to go the whole hog, you end up working experimentally and using ideas like site reliability engineering to help you define better experiments. In this example, the CPU usage is the service level indicator and 90% is our service level objective for that indicator. So monitoring and observability are starting points for working experimentally. And working experimentally for these kind of things means testing in production. So what kinds of things can we sensibly learn from production? If you buy into my model of all of this, then there's a slightly blurry line between what we test in our deployment pipeline and what we test in production. It's blurry mostly because it's contextual based on the circumstances of your system. If you're writing software that only you use, then you're the only person that will suffer if you screw up. So you can probably afford to take a few more risks. If you're writing software for a global company with millions or billions of users, a problem in production is somewhat more serious. So, you should probably take more care before you release and test your changes more thoroughly. If you're writing software that can kill people, then we'd probably expect you to be even more thorough and take even more care. So the threshold that determines releasability changes depending on our circumstance. In general though, I'd strongly recommend that you tend to prefer to detect problems as early as you possibly can. Aim to fail fast, so catching things in your deployment pipeline is nearly always better than catching them in production. But still, even so, there are some lessons that only production can teach us. Let's be clearer with an example. I've heard people talk about using testing in production to decide if your software all works together. If this is the only way that you test for this, to me, this says you don't mind too much if you kill production. Maybe you can fail quickly in production and the downtime doesn't matter too much. For the kinds of systems that I work on though, this is not usually good enough. So we will do this kind of testing elsewhere, usually as part of our acceptance testing. The arguments I've seen for doing this kind of testing in production rather than in, in a controlled acceptance testing environment, if I'm honest, don't ring very true to me. People say that it's too hard to maintain a good enough copy of production. But I think that says that they aren't using infrastructure as code, and they really should be. This is not to say that there aren't useful things that we can learn from production, or that there are circumstances in production where infrastructure as code is not the right answer. Even so, even after we've tested our system in a clone of the production environment, production is still the truth of our system. We are human, and so there are always going to be mistakes. So an extremely valuable form of production testing is a smoke test or health check that tells us that our system is up and running and is available for use, which we can run on a regular, maybe even continual basis. Are all the parts of our system that need to talk able to talk to each other? These are very useful things to know. One of the ways that this moves beyond, beyond only monitoring is by once again defining our responses if things start to look wrong. I did some tactical work on, a monitor, on monitoring a trading system once. The ops people were struggling to maintain a clear picture of the state of the system because they were overwhelmed with information. The logs were very horribly noisy. I wrote a tool that allowed us to code some filter criteria. You could think of these as tests in production. These tests looked for patterns that identified specific problems and then triggered an event. Then ops the ops team could attach actions in response to the events, maybe an alert, maybe a warning, uh, maybe setting off somebody's pager because this is a disaster going off. It was actually a pretty simple bit of code, but it helped the team encode their understanding of the system while it was in operation and tune out common noise in the logs.
And then still get alerted of things that in their experience told them they were likely to develop into real problems if they weren't addressed soon. There are some kinds of lesson that we can only learn from production like this. However thoroughly we research things, however many whiteboard models, focus groups or even beta re releases we try, for example, we don't really know if our ideas are the right ones until we find out whether our users value them and can make use of them. We can use monitoring and observability tools and techniques to collect data and tell us which routes through our system people take, for example, and which features they choose to use, perhaps. But once again, we can add value to this if we start to think of these things in terms of experiments or tests. Here's another simple example. Let's assume that we're tracking some common measure of our system. There's a model called the pirate metrics that suggests useful behaviours to track. But how do you know that your change made the difference? Working experimentally means more than only collecting data. We need to understand it in its context. And if we really want to learn, we need to work to control the variables so that we can really understand the results. Let's imagine we change the colour of the sign-up button to our website. We release the change and we get 20% more sign-ups the following week. Does that mean that our change worked? Well, maybe. But the real answer is that we don't know. It's not, it's not that simple. What if at the same time we released our change, another team launched a promotion that everybody was interested in? What if our site was featured in the news that week? Or what if over the past six months there was a random fluctuation of sign-ups, meaning that some weeks you got 30% more and some weeks 30% less? If we think of this as a test in production or an experiment, we're more likely to be thinking about how we can interpret these results and put them into context and how we can control the variables to make our answers clearer. This kind of experiment is probably never going to be definitive but they can still be useful in forming our decision making. In science, the usual strategy is to control the variables in an experiment sufficiently so that the results are very clear. Ideally, we'd like there to be one variable left behind in each experiment. Or we can use statistics. We collect enough different cases so that we can see trends and use probabilities and other statistical techniques to eliminate statistical outliers. Different kinds of science depend upon these techniques to different degrees. But basically, that's it. If you can manipulate one variable at a time, great, your results will be clear. But often, you can't, so you attempt to limit the variables as far as you can. And then you compare lots and lots of cases and try and identify patterns and trends. When we're testing in production, limiting the variables is often extremely difficult. But making change in small steps is one very effective way to do this. We isolate changes from the impacts of other changes by releasing them one at a time. If controlling the variables is difficult, we could still try uh, to aim to collect enough data so that stats can help if the numbers are big enough. The really tough cases are when we can't control the variables and we don't have enough users for stats to really come into play. At this point, we're basically guessing or we're engaging closely enough with our users that we know what at least some of them think. This may not be statistically defensible, but at least we know what some of our users are happy, presumably. Making informed subjective guesses at this point is fine, but I think it's useful to know that this is where, what we're doing when we're doing it. My point here is that the idea of being data-driven is an appealing one, but we also have to recognise its limits. If your software has a single user and you ask them if they like it, that's probably good enough. If your software has millions of users, anyone's user's opinion will be wrong at some level. So you need to scale up the collection of data to match the scale of your system, and you need to level up the rigour that you apply to mining meaning from it. At this point, we're starting to get into the realms of experimental design and real sociology to define different groups of users, which is just another way to control the variables. 
What do women 40 to 50 years old of median income think versus women 40 to 50 years old of low income? What do people with one set of political views think compared to those with another? And so on. This is not easy. This is the realm of professional data scientists and sociologists. At this level, the next step up in testing in production is to design the experiment as best we can in terms of selecting different cohorts of users and applying A-B testing. The massive web companies employ professional scientists to design these experiments. They figure out how to limit variables by carefully selecting the people that they put into each experimental group. And if you do this randomly, you're probably going to end up with just unbalanced groups. So your results will be skewed. If we are trying to see if a new game is working and we randomly divide people into groups A and B, we may end up with all of the group gamers in group B and none in group A. So whatever now the question is that we ask, our results are probably answering a different one. Uh, so rather than saying, do you like this game? We're probably asking the question, do you like games at all? None of this is easy. Science isn't easy, but it's still the best that we've got. I've heard people say that this means that things like A-B testing are useless and that being data-driven is a mistake. I think that's a mistake and represents a rather narrow view of science and its usefulness. Science isn't really about the answers themselves, it's about how we collect the best answers, whatever our context. Different applications of science have different levels of tolerance or precision. Measurements in quantum physics are much more precise than anything else. Measurements in sociology are rather vague and fuzzy in comparison. But measurements in sociology are still usually better than uninformed guesses, which is really the only other alternative because to be informed, we need information. I'd argue that being skeptical, critical, and looking for ways to learn to collect information at least allows us to progress from the ba uh, on the basis of informed guesses. Being data-driven doesn't mean, or at least shouldn't mean, being slaves to it. We still need to be thoughtful, but collecting the data and using it to inform our decisions is surely better than ignoring it. If we deliver software to a million people, and everyone hates it, that's clearly something that we'd like to know. If we sample a hundred people, and every one of them hates it, then that's sending us a message. Even if the message is only, we need to ask more people. How our software lands with our users is something that is of vital importance. We can try to learn this early on with proxy users on the team, or even better, real users on the team. But the, in, the reality is that we don't really know until real users are really using our software. That means that we need to gather information from our production systems. If we aim to understand what that information means, we need to be thoughtful, careful in how we collect it. I think that thinking of this as a form of test, or even better, a form of experiment, helps us to see better where our data collection may be flawed or unclear. If we treat this data collection as part of an experiment and think about how we can control the variables, that, that leads to better experiments and so better understanding. Production is messy, and so it's the most difficult place to control the variables. So think really hard about whether you can learn what you'd like to learn in the more controlled environment of automated testing in your deployment pipeline before release. But still, Testing in production is the only way to learn some things. It closes a vital feedback loop and allows us to answer a range of interesting questions. This isn't about cutting corners on testing elsewhere. It's about being feedback driven and informed about the reality of our software, whatever that might be. Thank you very much for watching.